Okay. So after this quick uh, detour of taking this, hello everyone. A very good evening uh, to our esteemed guest speaker, uh, respected professors, dear students, and everyone present over here today. I, Nilabjo Shubhashi Shodhuri, welcome you on behalf of History Society IIT Kanpur. Before we move ahead, I request you all to put your phone and other devices in the silent mode. So this session is organized by History Society IIT Kanpur in collaboration with Shiksha, Study Center for Indian Knowledge System, IIT Kanpur. We would now like to invite Mr. Proloy Manna for a Vedic intonation before we start our session. Thank you, Prale, for that wonderful intonation. So, since we started our journey a year and a half ago, with the guidance of our respected faculty coordinators, faculty advisors, and a dedicated effort of a core group, we have been able to organize talk sessions by researchers, subject matter experts, and professionals on diverse topics, events, and areas pertaining to history. So in our previous sessions, topics such as Bharat's civilizational journey, importance of archaeology and astronomy in constructing our history and contributions of revolutionaries towards building our nation have been discussed. IKS parallelly is aiming to integrate the vast knowledge system of India into our academic curriculum and make it accessible to the world via interdisciplinary research. This evening, we have with us someone very special who needs no introduction, but I'll still go on. Sanjeev Sanyal, currently a member of the Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister of India and formerly Principal Economic Advisor to the Prime Minister of India, is the author of multiple best-selling books like Revolutionaries, the Indian Renaissance, and the Incredible History of India's Geography. He is also the recipient of multiple literary awards like Kalinga Book Award 2023 and International Indian Achievers Award 2013. An alumnus of SRCC New Delhi and Oxford University, where he was a Rhodes Scholar, Sanjeevji has been awarded with many global accolades from multiple academic and economic platforms. An ex-MD and global strategist of Deutsche Bank, Sanjeevji has immensely contributed to reshaping Bharat's strategic thinking in global geoeconomical forums like the World Economic Forum Davos, where he was named as Young Global Leader in 2010. Sanjeevji has played a pivotal role in managing the Indian economy during COVID-19 pandemic, realizing its potential through G20's Global Action Plan. I request our respected faculty coordinator of History Society, Professor Jishnu Bhattacharya, and faculty coordinator of IKS Center and Associate Dean, Professor Arnab Bhattacharya, to come up on the stage and present Sanjeev Ji with the mementos as a token of our appreciation. We would like to thank Mr. Sanjeev Sanyal for making time for us from his hectic schedule to come and deliver his talk at IIT Kanpur. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome him with a huge round of applause. Okay, so um, very good evening, uh, friends, and let me begin by thanking the History Society of IIT Kanpur for uh, inviting me to be here. Uh, this is after two attempts, uh, I have uh, made it, so uh, <coughs> sorry about uh, 
earlier plans which got thrown off by uh, some emergency meetings I had to attend. But uh, so very, very pleased to be here. Now, um, the topic I've chosen is Bharat, that is India. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is the origins of our nationhood and about our civilizational imagination. Um, and hopefully, uh, I'll be able to give you a sense of why is it that we call ourselves the Bharata people and where uh, uh, did the name India come from? What is the link between the two? Very often, rather unnecessarily, these things can end up being controversial. As I will show you, there's absolutely no reason for them to be. Now, the reason we occasionally have these debates is not surprisingly has its origins in a colonial denial of India's civilizational identity. Now, it's not surprising that a colonial power having conquered us would come up with the idea that we were not a people at all. Because obviously a people who do not have a sense for themselves are very easy to consequently colonize and control. So you have, for example, John Strachey, who was acting Viceroy of India in 1872, stating, the first and most essential thing to learn about India is there is not and never was in India. Now that's very odd, given that there was something called East India Company. <laughs> and then there is Winston Churchill, who states that India is a geographical term. It is no more a united nation than the equator. So given that this is the thinking that they were trying to filter into all our textbooks, writing, uh, uh, that they were teaching us, a lot of the literature and so on, it's not surprising that, that a school of thought evolved that India was somehow very helpfully put together by uh, the British and that we should be deeply grateful to them and that in fact there's never been an Indian nation. But now I'm going to show you what is the history of all of this. So we have to go back right to the very beginning to know who were the Bharatas. Because this is the name by which we know, uh, call ourselves Bharata, right? So who are the Bharata? Now this name, the earliest mention of this word Bharat comes from the Rig Veda. Now I'm not going to get into a long debate about how old this is. I might, in passing, talk about it, but this is the oldest extant Indian text, possibly the oldest extant text in the world. So it comes up as the name, Bharat, comes up as the name of a tribe, which also has, by the way, another name called the Trutsu. So the Bharata Trutsu are a Vedic tribe, and they live on the banks of a river called the Saraswati, in what is now Haryana. Now the link between the tribe Bharata and this river Saraswati is very close. So much so that even today if you do Saraswati Puja, it ends even today with the incantation Bhagwati Bharati Devi Namaste. Particularly Bengalis here will have 100% uh, chanted this as a part of their Saraswati Puja every year. Now, the Saraswati is a very important part of the Rig Veda. It is mentioned 45 times in the Rig Veda. Her name appears 72 times. It's called the Great Flood. It's called the Mother of Rivers or the Sindhu Mata. It says limitless, unbroken, swift flowing, surpassing. So it's very clear that this river is the river of this, the, the, the Bharata people. Um, and, you know, they really, their entire identity is based on this. So the question obviously is, where is this Saraswati river? There is no river today called the Saraswati river. <clears throat> so where was the Saraswati river? And this has led some, particularly Western scholars, to mention that the Saraswati is somewhere in Afghanistan, in Central Asia and so on. But actually there is absolutely no need to guess where it is. Because in the Rig Veda, there is something called the Nadistuti Suktam. And in the Nadistuti Sukta, it mentions exactly where it is. So that what does the Nadistuti Sukta say? It says, O Ganga, Yamuna, Saraswati, Shududru, Parushni, Askini, and so on. This is an enumeration of the rivers that these, the Rig Vedic people knew, 
going east to west. And it clearly mentions that the Saraswati is between the Yamuna and the Shrutudru, which is the Sutlej. There is no scope for doubt where the Saraswati is. And there is many other tech, uh, places also it's mentioned, but I'm just showing you one place where it's clearly mentioned. The Rig Veda also says, pure is his course from the mountains to the ocean. Alone the streams of Saraswati hath listened. Again, it's absolutely clear that it flows from the mountain to the ocean. So, if it is between these Yamuna and Satlej and goes from the mountains to the sea, was there ever such a river? It turns out there was. The green lines that you can see are the paleo channels of a river that we now call the Ghaggar, which exists. It's clear there. It is so clear indeed that you can actually trace it on Google Maps. So you don't have to take my map, my words, anything. You can trace this. Indeed, after the monsoons, the Ghaggar, the upper reaches of it, even today flow. And it has lots of, of course, this river over thousands of years, over millennia, kept changing course because it's over a very flat terrain. So its course changed, but you can clearly see it starts out somewhere in the Shivalik Himalayas area goes through what is now Haryana, into northern Rajasthan, into what is now Pakistan, back into India and flows into the run of Kutch. In fact, the strange landscape of the run of Kutch owes a lot to the fact that it used to be the estuary of the Saraswati River. Indeed, if you went there six, seven thousand years ago, where it was a lot wetter, this area of the run of Kutch was essentially wet and would have looked a lot more like the Sundarbans. Which explains why, if you look at the Harappan seals, there are no lions in them, they're full of tigers. They have rhinos. These are all animals of Eastern India today, but in a wetter climate, they were all from here. There, were no, there by the way, are no lions in any, in any of the Harappan seals. And lions are a very evocative animal. So if you know about the lion, you're definitely going to have it in a seal. So this was tiger country, rhino country, wet, and this huge river flowing through it. Now, we have further proof that it must have been important to civilization because the majority of the Harappan sites are actually along the dry riverbed of this river. I have, you know, they're not only on our side of the border, they're even on the Pakistan side of the border. So it's not you know, uh, nationalist Indian archaeologists uh, who are finding them, even the Pakistanis. In fact, the Pakistanis are finding more. As you can see, and a large proportion of them are early Harappan sites rather than, uh, you know, uh, just m uh, mature Harappan sites. And then we know from, from the geologists and various surveys, and many surveys have now been done, that there was a major climate event around about 2000 BC, 1900 BC, in which this climate changed. The Saraswati River, which was already in decline by this point, by the way, the Saraswati didn't suddenly dry up in 2000 BC. It was already in some distress. In 2000 BC, it completely dries up. The weather of this area completely dries up. The cities of the, of the Harappan civilization, of the mature Harappan period, begin to be abandoned. And of course, this, not only does the river dry up, sea levels actually go down from where they were to present levels. And so it leaves behind the run of Kutch, which you now know as the salt flats. Now, first thing I have hopefully established that there was a Saraswati river, it flowed and so on and so forth. Now, the Bharata tribe that I mentioned lived on the banks of that river. And they called their homeland the Sapta Sindhu, or the land of the seven rivers, Sapta Sindhava. This is the first territorial or geographical term that you have in the Rig Veda. It's a, it comes up quite frequently, and it was important because it was the homeland of this Bharata tribe. Now mo notice that this is actually a very small area, roughly what is modern Haryana and maybe the adjoining areas of Rajasthan and Punjab. This is not a very large area. And why do I say this? Because these seven rivers very often are confused as Saraswati, 
five rivers of Punjab and Indus. But in fact, all the evidence from the Rig Veda suggest that the seven rivers are merely the tributaries of just the Saraswati itself. Why? Here is one example. It says, coming together, glorious, loudly roaring Saraswati, mother of floods, the seventh, with copious milk, with fair streams strongly flowing, fully swelled by the volume of their waters. In other words, all their waters are coming together into this seventh stream. So you're dealing with a very, very small area, which is essentially Haryana, and the Bharata tribe calls it the land of the seven rivers. So it's a very small area. Now, more evidence to show that we are dealing with a small area. Because in the Mahabharat, Balram goes on a pilgrimage. He's not a part of the Kurukshetra war, if you remember. <clears throat> he doesn't fight the war. Instead, he goes on a pilgrimage along the banks of this, of the Saraswati, which, by the way, is already drying up. It's already dried up in bits. Okay. And he walks along this, and then he mentions the seven streams of the Saraswati in the Mahabharat book um, 9 of the Shalya Parva, chapter 38, you can check it yourself, where the seven tributaries of the Saraswati are clearly mentioned. They are Suparva, Kanchanakshi, Vishala, Manorama, Oghavati, Surenu, and Vimaladukha. Now, we don't actually have any of these rivers with these names today. And we can't really tell who they are, but the first thing you can tell that this is not the rivers of Punjab or the Sindhu. That is clear. We also have a further piece of evidence. The Saraswati, full of sacred rivers, flows in Kurukshetra under the name of Oghavati. So at least we know that one of the streams, Oghavati, used to flow in Kurukshetra, and it is one of the parts of the Saraswati. So again, it's the point I'm making that the Sapta Sindhu is actually a very small area. It deals with the original homeland of the Bharata tribe. It's essentially Haryana. So when next time you meet people from Haryana, have some respect. <laughs> so now, if this is just dealing with this small Haryanavi tribe, how did it end up becoming the name by which we are all proudly calling ourselves? To understand this, you need to understand the one major political event that is clearly mentioned in the Rig Veda. There are many things vaguely mentioned, but there is one event, political event, which is the earliest political event that we clearly can talk, uh, can know about in Indian history in the Rig Veda. And it is something called the Battle of Ten Kings. So what happens is that the Bharatas have a chieftain called Sudasa. And he, his guru is the Rishi Vashishtha. Now they somehow managed to anger a coalition of ten tribes coming from the west. And this confederacy of ten tribes attacked them. And so we have a description of <coughs> the Bharata tribe crossing the Saraswati and going to the riv river Parushni, which is Ravi. Uh, which is <coughs> and there, there is a huge battle in which the Bharatas completely defeat and destroy the coalition of ten kings. The ten tribes are completely destroyed. There is, you know, there are descriptions of how 6,666 uh, 6, um, soldiers of, of the, uh, of the uh, ten tribes are drowned in the river Ravi as they are trying to escape. And then the Sudas turns to the Yamuna and there he defeats another chieftain or tribe called Bheda. So he then creates India's first empire. And then he conducts the first Ashwamedha Yagya and declares himself the Chakravartin, whose symbol is the Chakra. Now, <clears throat> is it this political victory that leads to us being called the Bharatas, or us calling ourselves the Bharatas? In fact, no. It is what they do next that is the real game changer. What they do is very interesting. You see, throughout history, when one tribe or people or group defeat another tribe, the natural thing is to say, look, our God must be more powerful than your God. So therefore, you must now worship our God. 
that is natural phenomena however the bharatas did something very very different what they did is they called all the wise rishis etc wise men of all the defeated tribes and in fact even of the tribes they hadn't defeated but they just happened to be in contact with and they compiled all their wisdom into texts that we now know as the vedas the vedas are explicitly samhita which is just a compilation they do not claim to be the origin of anything they are compiling what they already say existed in fact the rig veda begins the first chant of the rig veda begins read it yourself it is a chant to agni where it says they pay respect to both the ancient and modern rishis so modern rishis of their time yeah so what are they doing they are laying out a civilizational operating system for assimilation as opposed to imposition and it is extraordinary that we are not taught this but is explicitly there in the rigveda you read i told you about the very first chant of the rigveda now read the very last chant of the rigveda what does it say it is the common fire of indic civilization it says it basically gives the gods of all the tribes a place around the yagya fire the sacrificial fire and it explicitly says that all the ancient gods have a place around the fire so here i'm going to give you the english translation it says now actually i did not know that there was a great vedic chanter here in the audience i would have actually sent this ahead and asked you to chant it for you because the the chanting of this is absolutely beautiful but nevertheless uh, unless you already know this do you know it know this chant sangacham so why don't you chant come here and chant it ha huh? come then i will explain what it actually is it is actually our civilizational contract okay and i'll i'll read it out in english and then he can chant it okay come it says assemble speak together let your minds be of one accord as all the ancient gods take their rightful seat around the fire the place is common common the assembly common the mind so be your thoughts united a common purpose do i lay be- before you and together we make our offerings into the fire united be your resolve may your minds come together united be the thoughts of all that we may happily agree this is our civilizational contract now he is going he is going to chant it out for you in case you didn't believe me <laughs> om shri gurubhyo namaha हरि ओं संगाछध संवद्व संवोमना सिजानताग यथापूर्व संजाना उपासते सनो मंत्र सी सनम मन सह चिमेषा सनम मंत्रिमंत्र सो हविषा जुहोमि सनी व आकूति सन हृदयानी वह सनमस्तु वो मनो यथा आवस्सु सहासती थैंक यू स्टे हियर स्टे हियर आई हैव गॉट मोर यूज फॉर यू नाउ दिस इज इंपॉर्टेंट बिकॉज यू सी दिस इज अ वेरी पावरफुल आइडिया ऑफ असिमुलेशन सो नाउ this idea begins to spread and we know that these rishis were going all over telling people and more and more people signed up to it so this is our idea so i am bengali i my homeland comes some 1700 kilometers to the east of haryana so why do i call myself a bharata because a long long time ago my ancestors signed up to this idea and they contributed their gods to the to the around the sacrificial fire Now, I don't know what gods they worship then, but since I am a very hardcore Shakta, I will say it must be Kali or Bhavani or Durga or some such deity. And so they were given a space around the sacrificial fire. And in that act, I accepted all the gods of all the others. This is the act by which this assimilative process takes place. By the way, this is 
in this this is why the rig veda is called the shruti text it is the operating system all the other texts that exist after the vedas are called the smriti texts they are like the apps this is the operating system you can keep adding apps this is how the whole system is set up now this idea of india begins to spread so now the sapta sindhu idea goes from seven rivers that were tributaries of the saraswati to covering the entire subcontinent so then in the puranic texts you have the sapta sindhu they have different they are different so here is a chant that when you do ritual bathing many of you probably do yourselves gange chaiva to aap jante hi ho ke to aap chaiva 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 गंगे च यमुने चैवा गोदावरी सरस्वती नर्मदे सिंधु कावेरी जले सन्निधि नोटिस हियर गंगा ओ गंगा यमुना गोदावरी सरस्वती नर्मदा सिंधु कावेरी रिवर सो दीज आर सेवन रिवर्स नाउ दिस इंक्लूड्स गोदावरी इट इंक्लूड्स कावेरी इट इंक्लूड्स नर्मदा या सो यू कैन सी द हाउ द आइडिया ऑफ द सेवन रिवर्स हैज नाउ एक्सपेंडेड so this idea of, now this is the sapta sindhu therefore we have become the bharatas can you see that thank you i have taken this obviously from the brahma <coughs> prapuran but similar things are there in all the purans they have a set format and then <coughs> in all the purans there is a description of what this bhar bharat khanda is what this land landscape the sacred landscape is so in the puran and this is also true of the epics i'm just going to read here from the brahma puran because everybody quotes the vishnu puran as if it's only there it's actually there in every puran i have done it from the brahma puran just to be different it says the varsha the land that is north of the ocean and south of the himalaya himavat is known by the name bharata and the people there are known as bharati some version of this with slightly different wording will be there in all the puranas now in the specific case of the brahma puran it also further mentions who are our neighboring people it says that to the east the kiratas who are the tibeto burman people live and to the west the yavanas live so i know roughly speaking when the brahma puran must have been finalized because the yavanas are living to our west that could only have happened during the period between alexander's invasion and the kushan kushans when the kushans evicted the indo greeks so it's somewhere second third century uh, bc is the period from which the brahma puran must come so this is where we are, what we are dealing with and you can clearly tell the landscape but it goes more than that it's not just south of the mountains north of the ocean that you may have heard before it has detailed descriptions of the interiors of india for example it by the way loves the number 7 so everything is done in these sevens so the seven mountain ranges of india also says so there's mahindra which is eastern ghats malaya which is southern western ghats what we call the nilgiris the sahya which is the sahyadris we still call it the sahyadris which is the northern western ghats the sukti mat there's some dispute about what it means i think it is the ravalis the riksha which is the satpuras the vindhyas which in those days related only to the eastern vindhyas what we call the eastern vindhyas and the paryatra which is the western vindhyas and since the seven rivers did not include the brahmaputra and none of these are from the northeast if you are feeling left out it also says though there are those who reside in the east such as the inhabitants of kamrup yeah and you can check all of this from the brahma puran as adapted by bibek debroy's translation now despite the addition of these south indian names there is always somebody who will raise the issue but what about the dravidians so now i'm going to tell you a little bit about the sangam text this is the oldest collection of tamil texts that exist there is nothing older and of the sangam literature collection compilation the tolkapiyam is a grammatical treatise is the oldest sangam texts from circa 2nd century bc there is also nothing older 
and its preface the preface of this text states in the virtuous tamil speaking land that extends from venkatam in the north to kumari in the south kumari is kanyakumari venkatam is uh, venkata the hills which are today just about in andhra pradesh but you can see that you can even today mark out <coughs> the shape and size of tamil nadu roughly from this description even today and this is the first um uh, sort of prop, uh, enunciation of a tamil tamil identity there is also no older um sort of expression of tamil identity that that, that exists now in that same preface it also states in the wisdom of the four vedas rooted okay so the first expression of tamil identity is already saying that their identity is rooted in the four vedas there is no way of getting around this now it isn't that while we expanded out and you know this idea expanded that we poor forgot poor haryana that is still remembered by later people as the origin point and so it continues to be remembered as brahmavarta the and which is brahmavarta it is the land between the saraswati and the drishadvati both of them are dried rivers by the way as it happens to be last weekend i was <coughs> in a very big site which is on the banks of the drishadvati called rakhi gadi so some of you may have seen on twitter i had tweeted and the huge harappan site huge uh, they have just about done maybe 5% maybe 2% of it and you know they found double story houses and all kinds of things a stadium by the way so many interesting things so i hope i have now been able to convince you about, about how the idea of the bharatas and their homeland of the seven rivers expanded now there is however another tradition of how we came to be called bharatvarsha and that relates to the much later the puranic and mahabharata era texts and as i already told you they are apart from the uh, they are separated from the vedic texts by se not centuries but millennia now here we need to i need to mention that the vedic texts are very clear that the saraswati was not drying up it was in full flow and we know that even in the mature harappan period the river was already beginning to die so the vedic texts the rigveda particularly is either an early harappan text or a pre harappan text and we are now dealing here with the puranic texts i told you third fourth fifth century maybe a little bit earlier texts not much more even the earliest uh, puranic texts maybe 8th 9th century bc at most so there are thousands of years gap between the two and in the later texts the story becomes that we call ourselves bharat varsha after a king called raja bharat and in these texts which include by the way jain texts as well this raja bharat not to be confused with dushyant and shakuntala san bharat which is there in kalidas which is an even later tradition this earlier tradition says there was this, this bharat was the son of a king called rishab who left his throne and he is of course the founder of jain tradition and rishab's father was a very great conqueror called nabhi and it is said the nabhi had also created a big empire so in, in incidentally india also has another name in classical times nabhi varsha anyway this is one tradition now the question is is this raja bharat in any way linked to this raja sudas for this i do not know i haven't been able to solve this there may be other scholars here who can solve this puzzle there is a much older tradition of bharat bharat varsha and bharat and there is a later tradition of bharat as well how the two are linked i do not know one possibility and i am this is speculation so be clear is that since so much time had elapsed between raja sudas and this period Raja Sudas has this this Raja Bharat because remember this Raja Bharat by the time the Puranas are also being written is mentioned as somebody very long ago. So this is maybe 
a distant memory of Sudas. Because very often kings are remembered by the names of their tribes. This is not a very common thing. It's even true today. You know, princess of Gandhar is Gandhari. Uh, princess of Panchals is Panchali. Uh, even today, oh, king of Udaipur will be very often called Uday, just Udaipur. So it may be that <coughs> the Sudas is remembered by the name of his tribe. Because there are several minor similarities. Because King Bharat also conquers a big empire. He also conducts the Ashwamedha, supposedly the first Ashwamedha Yagya. He declares himself the Chakravartin and so on and so forth. Now, I do not know the, the solution to this puzzle. I'm hoping one of you will be able to resolve it. I'm just presenting it as a problem. But what is interesting is that the symbol of the Chakravartin, whether it is Sudas or it is Raj Bharat, same person, different person, whatever, their symbol is the chakra, the wheel. It is still there on our flag. Right? So, I always point out to people that the Mauryan chakra is not some great Buddhist symbol. It is also used as a Buddhist symbol. But when you look at it, look at what it really is. It's four growling lions staring down at you from the top of a stamba with these symbols of the wheel. This is essentially the Mauryans putting a royal symbol, growling down on you. Basically, this is about expressing the power of the state. And so, quite correctly, maybe subconsciously, we adopted it as a symbol of the state as well. Today, too, it is the symbol of the state. The power of the state, yeah? Now, Even as this idea of Sapta Sindhu was expanding, the Bharata idea was expanding, not everybody was happy about this whole thing. It appears that we had a counterculture who was related to us, but uh, were kind of like a mirror opposite. And these people were the uh, Avestans. They are very similar to the Rig Veda people. Their language is almost identical, except for one Phonetic, one or two phonetic shifts. One of them being, the sound sa becomes the sound ha in uh, Avestan Persian. Okay, these are, Avestans are the early Persians. Uh, this is the language in which the uh, Zoroastrian, earliest Zoroastrian text is written. And it is, as I said, written in a language which is almost identical to Rig Vedic Sanskrit except for a few phonetic changes, one of the main ones being sa becomes a ha. A similar thing exists even today in Assamese. So now what happens in the Western texts, there is a text called the Videvadatta, which is their oldest, one of the oldest texts, which interestingly says against the Devas. What is, why is this interesting? Because you see in the Rig Vedic texts, the Devas and the Asuras are both two sets of deities. There is no good and bad in there. This is a later tradition. In the original text, they are, they are actually brother. They are siblings, the Devas and the Asuras. And there are two sets of deities, both of whom are worshipped, perhaps by different tribes, maybe by the same tribe, I can't tell. But many of the gods like Varuna, Rudra, etc. are actually Asuras. And then later on, the Bharatas, as their ideas spread, the idea begins to appear that the Devas are the gods and the Asuras are somehow um, evil. Not We never quite become evil, but there is something quite of not quite uh, good about them. Yeah. So this idea begins to seep in here. But the exact opposite happens with the Western Iranians. They worship the Ahura, the Asura, and they are against the Devas. But in this text, Videvadatta, they mention various homelands that they originally had. And they mention in there a place that they mention as Hapta Hindu, which is obviously Sapta Sindhu. They mention a river called Harakwati, which is Saraswati. And it also mentions that these lands were taken away by Angara Mainyu, who was the leader of the Devas. It then mentions also probably what was climate change because it says Hapta Hindu was a beautiful land 
but now it has become too hot and that they are now violating their funerary rites by burying the dead it's quite interesting because we see burial burial in the harappan later harappan sites particularly so something here is going on i'm guessing here but one of the tribes that were defeated in the battle of 10 kings is called the parasas this is the ancient name by which the indians called the persians possibly possibly the persians were one of the defeated tribes that didn't sign up to that contract and left westward now i told you about the ancient in uh, 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 ancient persian name of india hapt hindu now that gets shortened to hindu right i mentioned this here because very often hindu is taken from the sindhu river but in fact the earliest mention of the word hindu actually doesn't associate with the sindhu river but it relates to the hapt hindu it's very clear you can check it up yourself and so hindu in my view is a shortening of sapt sindhu to hindu and then that becomes the name by which in the middle east we are known even today that name then goes further westward and in greco roman tradition we get names like indioi india megasthenes indica eastwards however the name is somewhat different we are known as sindhu yandu tiangju ancient greeks call us hindavi um medieval arabs call us al hind and not surprisingly from all of this you get the name india now you can clearly see that they have very common roots the name bharata is the name of the tribe that lived on the sapta sindhu and that sapta sindhu name became hapta hindu hindu india and so on they relate to exactly the same history so these two names are very closely related to each other although one of the name is a name by which we call ourselves the other name is a corruption of another name by which we used to call ourselves now i have told you about very ancient times bronze age then i told you about iron age which is the puranic phase did we remember this idea of a, a, a sacred landscape and a nationhood into the medieval period so let me show you that even in the medieval period all of these things are true so you are all familiar <coughs> with the story of the sati yeah what happens here is that her father daksha decides to throw a yagya big yagya calls all the gods all the great sages of that time but leaves out sati's own husband shiva right now this is not merely an ego thing for sati let me tell you this is a fundamental violation of the fact that all the gods have a place around the fire so this is actually a serious violation so it's not just oh my god my husband hasn't been called by not calling Sh Sh shiva daksha is effectively violating the original contract so it's a rather serious issue which is why when she turns out in her own body by violating it and burning herself into the fire she destroys and violates the yagya itself because it is invalid what the medieval people are doing is essentially reiterating the same idea and then shiva lifts her body and says that it will he will destroy the, the, the universe and vishnu realizes what is happening and he cuts up her body and scatters it how does he scatter it it is again not randomly scattered it is scattered over a certain landscape and look here the northern most is in kashmir now in unfortunately uh, pakistan controlled kashmir the western most is in balochistan hinglaj mata southern most is kanyakumari and eastern most is from my friend state tripura sundari and there's a bit of a bunching in the east that's why i keep saying that we have some extra points for being shaktas but otherwise you can see it is it is not a 
it is scattered over a particular landscape and these are the shaktapeets so again what is happening sati is uniting this land say the land of the bharatas in her own body same thing happens shankaracharya goes on a yatra across india look at the landscape he is traversing he is from the southern tip of india he goes to the north sharda peet he goes to dwarka he goes to kamrup right then he sets up four mutts they are also not randomly scattered they are puri shringeri dwarka badrinath four corners of that same so you can see that and by the way this is happening in many others even even the asuric tradition in hinduism has the same so the rishi kashyapa who is the father of all the asuras and the devas kashmir is named after him his grandson is prahlad the asur he was an asur and prahlad is linked to multan his grandson is mahabali who is associated with kerala his grandson is banasur associated with assam we go sunitpur ha uh, tezpur same place that was where you can see this is all in the same logic and there is another name by which in the medieval period we call ourselves there is a term called jambu dwipa <clears throat> now there is a problem with this term it is used very often in jain buddhist puranic texts and there is some confusion happens because very often it is used both in geographical context and in cosmological context causing unending amount of confusion but to the extent it is used for geographical uh, uses it seems to be that it either meant the subcontinent or it meant maybe the wider continent from which uh, bharata khanda uh, was a part but there can be some debate about this issue um sometimes jambu dwip relates to just the subcontinent itself so the question is why name a subcontinent after a fruit right jambu dwip now there is a debate about the origins of the name some people think it is named after jambul which is the jamu jam, uh, jamun but in fact i have checked this with bibek debro as well who is arguably the greatest living sanskrit scholar it is actually named after the jambu fruit which is the rose apple now just look at a rose apple it narrows at the bottom and the top has these slightly higher ridged thing now look at a map of india does it not look the same it is basically the peninsula with these mountains at the top it is a very simple way of explaining without a map what the <coughs> geographical shape of india is so that is my my explanation of why we are called jambu dwipa now i told you medieval period now i'll say okay okay maybe in ancient maybe very ancient maybe in medieval period but surely by you know modern period we began to forget the fact that we were a nation this is the trichy de declaration of the maradu pandyan in 1801 this was during the uprising of the polygars against the east india company this is the chief of the maradu pandyans made a declaration of independence and look at what the invocation is he says to the all the castes and peoples the brahmins the kshatriyas the vaisyas the shudras and the muslims interestingly includes the muslims that is in the jambu subcontinent of jambu dwipa this notice is given so the declaration of independence that maradu pandyan is doing in trichy is not only in the name of all these people but it's also not in the name of just the tamilkam or tamil nadu he is doing it in the name of all the people of jambu dwipa again you know somewhat inconvenient to those with this dravidianist theology but it is very clear that there is a conception of a nationhood that is very strong that is there <clears throat> and then vivekanand 90 years later 80 years later or 90 years later 1890 again he goes towards all of india 
before he goes for his chicago lecture this is not a random wandering around you know there is an order he comes from the east goes north goes west goes south so it is very very clear that there is a conception of a sacred geography of a certain na nationhood of a certain uh, idea of assimilation that is very very deep rooted in our civilizational history i want to make it clear that this is however not a pure civilization this civilization has grown by assimilating all kinds of ideas this didn't only include ideas from within our geographical frontier but also from outside so there are many ideas that came from people through exchange of trade migration invasion all kind just ideas being exchanged and so there is it is important to acknowledge the contributions of foreigners to creating this evolving civilization it is not a static civilization uh, that may have expanded in the beginning and then kind of froze after all even the language in which i am speaking to you is a contribution from a foreign conquest english however the fact that i appreciate the contributions of foreign invasions and migrations and so on does not mean i have to celebrate my own subjugation i can quite happily appreciate shakespeare i can love to eat an english breakfast but i don't have to be enthusiastic about the british raj in the same way i can appreciate the beauty of the taj mahal but i don't have to be enthusiastic about mughal rule now the republic the founders of the republic of india were very conscious of this long history and they were very conscious that the, that the republic they were creating was a modern manifestation of a very ancient ancient civilizational nation and so jawaharlal nehru himself on the 15th of august 1947 what do he say the soul of a nation long suppressed finds utterance for the soul of a nation to have been long suppressed it had to have existed for a long time so right in the beginning at the moment of independence there is the expression of the soul of a nation long suppressed of an ancient civilization the the the, the passing on of power is done with what the sengol a chola symbol and the very first line of the constitution states this it says india that is bharat shall be a union of states it is a union of states right union means it's all put together it's not different states which have kind of signed on to be kind of some sort of a federation this is a union of states and it is very clear that these are interchangeable names therefore it is perfectly fine to use both names both names are valid and they should be used and by the way ambedkar knew that maybe a 75 years later somebody would raise some issues and try to misinterpret this whole thing so in a speech to the constituent assembly on the 4th of november 1948 he stated what he meant by this states though the country and the people may be divided into different states for convenience of administration the country is one integral whole its people a single people living under a single imperium derived from a single source the drafting committee thought that it would be better to make it clear at the onset than to leave it to the speculation to leave it to speculation or dispute particularly from descendants of nehru uh, he didn't say it but i did <clears throat> so i hope i have been able to convince you about what this long history is it's not a history that has suddenly popped up because we have a right wing government in place this is a very strong and very deeply rooted history which he comes out over thousands of years repeated 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 and i have only had uh i have been speaking now for how long 730 i started at about 1 hour i have been speaking so 
if i if you give me more time i can give you three more hours worth of evidence so with that thank you and vande mataram so uh, please give a big round of applause for sanjeev ji for his insightful and engaging talk and thank you pralay for that wonderful rendition helping him with the shlokas so a big round of applause for him as well the book signing session will commence after the q and a session uh, and it will be outside l16 please make sure that the books are kept at the table properly for signing and please avoid making a queue uh, only hing english and hindi copies of the book the revolutionary by sir is available over there so please uh, go ahead and take a look uh, so we'll now have the q and a session uh, since we expect a lot of questions and queries from the audience we'll limit our questions to around 12 to 15 no, uh, no, 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 no. 5 or 6 okay i'm tired that's what they so we'll keep so we'll keep it to 5 and 6 please and keep your questions brief and precise and uh, since yeah please keep them to the topic because i know many people want to ask me questions on economics but that is for a, this is an event of the history society i can also give you other lectures on urban design on naval architecture many other su favorite subjects of mine but <laughs> but today let's fix it to uh, the subject at hand so uh, two very quick questions one is that you mentioned that it started with the rigveda that is the oldest written account we have but we were able to write history by then so obviously the civilization had evolved to a very great extent before that what about that and the shakti peeth there was one in sri lanka on the map you showed what about that so this is very important <coughs> point just let me have some water can somebody just open this for me yeah so <coughs> basically what is happening one important thing is that even in the indian tradition in the hindu tradition the vedas are shashvat no but they have no beginning they were there before they were put together they are supposed to be eternal but what really is being expressed is that if they existed before they were compiled into the samhita okay and the very first chant of the rigveda is telling you so because it's telling you yes we are paying bowing to today's rishis we are also bowing to the rishis of before i e those before this compilation because many of the things that are in the compilation come from those earlier rishis so the 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 rigveda basically is not the beginning of civilization it is the beginning of our civilizational identity there are different things there already clearly existed some sort of a civilization in the saraswati indus that general zone we already also know that there was increasingly archaeology suggest a related but somewhat separate civilization on the gangetic plains we are finding stuff we know from archaeology gujarat and those places also had a civilization and i don't think peninsula india has been properly uh, excavated i am 100% sure you'll find very very old bronze age sites in peninsula india as well even though today they are not there but i'm 100% sure they are there for a variety of reasons which we need to so what i am trying to say is that there already existed various scattered linked they were trading with each other they knew each other maybe but there were bunch of these civilizations scattered around the indian subcontinent some people may have been going out some tribes may be coming in but there was a milieu of tribes so the rigveda is not the source of that what the rigveda is doing and this operating system i describe is doing is interlinking them into one identity that is what is going on they are pre existing people with pre existing gods what this so in different countries different ways of unifying has happened in china for example the first emperor basically burnt all the books before him and forced everybody onto the same platform that is the way they did it good or bad that's the their way of doing it 
the romans did it and also through conquest or whatever they did a part of both there was a dominant latin culture but they used to be quite happy to incorporate gods and other things from others as well greeks culture they took on board so they had a they also had a combination of that the indian system was a different one the indian system was let's create an operating system and then you can keep adding apps onto this which is different civilizational apps are being added onto it on this framework you can keep doing it even today right new, it is perfectly okay to come if if you come up with a new philosophy and it finds adherents hinduism has no problem providing it with a space in fact it doesn't say so but <clears throat> frankly there is a space even for the non gods of the atheists around the sacrificial fire hinduism doesn't have a problem with uh, atheism why because this is an operating system that allows everybody so to answer your point rigveda is not the beginning of civilization in the indian subcontinent it marks the the contract marks the beginning of a civil unified civilizational identity that was my first the answer to your first question what was your second question just remind me ha huh. so impo shakti beat so you have to understand that what we call the landscape of india while there was obviously a particular um importance given to the landscape of uh, the indian subcontinent do remember that at various points of time what indians thought as being the civilizational extent has waxed and waned there were periods when afghanistan was a part of the civilizational context indonesia was a, a part of the civilizational context now so this is very interesting so what is the a uh, sanskrit word for a barbarian i e those who are outside of civilization now that waxes and wanes from different points in time indians for example never called the indonesians mlecha because they were within the civilizational context they were buddhist uh, hindu and so on even today bali is a hindu majority uh, country uh, so you know so this is very interesting so that civilizational context is waxing and waning so in that context sri lanka was for long periods of time a part of that civilizational context it's frankly you can literally hop across uh, to sri lanka to the place where the shakti peet is it's at the absolute northern tip and it was mostly tamil territory even in earlier periods so hence the the the, the point and yes Thank you so much. It was wonderful uh, to hear you. Oh. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. So my question, very quick question, is uh, you know, like uh, despite having so many scholars, um, particularly Sanskrit scholars, and we were never taught uh, Ved or Sanskrit when I, I was growing up in Kolkata. So we never had that kind of culture. Uh, and what happened to this kind of uh, thing that uh, gradual declination of Bengali culture, which we used to be, for example, you were actually referring to that Shakti Peet, and then so many of these kind of things, and Bengalis were actually. perpetual into that so uh, what happened uh, that is my first question and second question is that in today's context when we are actually looking at this renaming renaming of this kind of things na for example there are obvious bengali things which are uh, in bangladesh what happened so they borrowed many of these terms from uh, from arabic or persian that kind of thing so in bengal that happened during the sultanate like the islamic uh, rule but in in today's era so we are having the government who are changing these things for example ram dhonu to wrong dhonu and something like that uh, ashmani color and things like that so these were actually doing uh, with a political kind of populist kind of nature and how you can uh, answer to <clears throat> see like like uh, punjab bengal was also partitioned it was partitioned on religious lines and it was a very traumatic uh, experience for many bengalis uh, my mother's family for example comes from the wrong side of the border uh, they used to be big mill owners by the way some of you may have even heard of the mohini mills which was once upon a time one of uh, india's maybe asia's uh, largest uh, cotton mills fell on the wrong side of the border so my family migrated to uh, what is, uh, to west bengal so this was a very traumatic shock 
but for some reason this traumatic shock in itself would not explain the uh what should i call um sort of almost stagnation of um uh, bengali culture that has happened since uh independence but particularly since 1969 70 um it does nothing to do with my birth i believe <coughs> which was in 1970 so i'm just clarifying this because even immediately in the first two decades after independence kolkata remained india's largest economic hub in 1970 when i was born it was still the biggest industrial hub of india it was india's largest city the the it was uh, the the kolkata stock exchange was uh, you know the big stock exchange uh, and many of the big uh, industrial houses had their headquarters in kolkata and then right in front of me uh kolkata basically died and as i keep saying it didn't really die it was actually murdered and i am a witness of that murder now that murdering of kolkata happened at least because under the likes of jyoti basu and so on it was not just the economic uh system that got destroyed it was a entire intellectual cultural framework that got destroyed and it was deliberately done some of us who are here there are several bengalis in the audience who are of my age will remember what happened whether it's mohri jhapi massacre or the sai bari massacre or 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 what happened to the universities and the politicization of all of that and as the economy went down you know bengalis for a long time tried to kind of uh justify to themselves that hey, okay the economy has gone off to bombay or bangalore or whatever but we are still the cultural capital of india but i'm sorry you know even in kolkata bengalis go to watch bollywood films more than they do bengali films now this is the place that 100 years ago and i'm very proud of our ancestors 100 years ago if you had gone and asked the bengali intellectuals who would you have got you would have tagore you would have sri aurobindo you would have vivekanand you would have netaji you would have acharya jagadish chandra bose today you have sanjeev sanyal clearly clearly a deterioration <laughs> i'm i'm just want to add on two points on saraswati and gakkar hmm. i'm from haryana and for us it was never a question that saraswati existed or not even in yamuna nagar district there is a town named saraswati nagar which is on the bank of saraswati river and yes it's called saraswati yes yeah. and it is called saraswati and like my that is the pronunciation of the yes, locals yes. that's all and gagar is still a very live river and it flow 12 4 in the monsoons months. it's quite strong yeah and it still like for 12 month it is still a very strong river hmm. and even we have folklores like rishi markande is married to saraswati rivers and they both have competition who will reach to the sea fast so saraswati choose the underground way so that's why it lost its way so that is the story of it drying up yes. that's how they justified it yes yeah. exactly no but it is true this is the point i make to everybody you see this is only people in academia in particularly in the west now taken on by indian academia will argue with what i just presented to you it's blatantly obvious if you go to haryana like you mentioned and not only haryana even into northern rajasthan you can see the dry river bed you can see sites like kalibangana right on the site so it's not and you know after the monsoons for a few months it does flow it still flows today uh, uh, near chandigarh in fact it is the flow is quite big yes exactly yeah panjik exactly so the it's not a completely dried up river it, for a few months it actually is a reasonable and when the floods you do get fairly devastating floods even today there you go you still get floods on that flood plain uh good afternoon sir good, good evening sir yes. <laughs> uh, sir as you said uh, 
there are a lot of excavations that has to happen uh, and that will give us a window in the, of our past. But sir, there are a lot of uh, Sanskrit texts that has yet to be translated. Uh, so, sir, uh, is there a way that uh, maybe we can be a part of uh, yes, this, this process? Yes, this is actually a very important point you've raised. The National Manuscript Mission alone has 4 lakh manuscripts. A lot of it is, by the way, online. But even that is not online. But the fact of the matter is, these m n almost none of these 4 lakh manuscripts have been translated. We have no idea what's in it. Now, if you have an interest in this, by the way, it's not good enough to only know Sanskrit. You actually have to spend some time on epigraphy and know because the scripts changed over time. And different parts of the country use different scripts at different points in time. But it's not rocket science. You put in a little bit of effort, you'll get it. There are four lakh valuable texts just lying there. Now, unfortunately, as happens with every government department, they act like they are, they, you know, won't let scholars have use of it. But if you have an interest in this, I, I will personally get you access to that. If, if you have an interest in it. Because, you know, who knows what kinds of texts they are. They are texts on science, there will be texts on economics. You know, wohi ek arthashastra hai, Kautilya Kari. There must be other texts also, before and after Kautilya. What are those texts? There must be, you know, Arya Bhatta was not the only guy. He didn't, Arya Bhatta couldn't have emerged out of thin air. There must be in a tradition of texts before him. And it's very likely there were texts after him. So, there has to be a real... You know, there'll be amazing texts. You know, we have Shushrut and Char, Charak. Charak. But, but the point is, they are very ancient texts. Are you telling me that nobody else wrote any text after that? So, they, there are 4 lakh texts. And I'm 100% sure, even if 10-15% of those are really valuable texts, that still runs into tens of thousands of texts. Somebody has to look at them. So, please. Uh, uh. Good evening, sir. My name is Ayush and I wanted to ask a question that uh, when you were talking about uh, when the foundation of Bharat was being laid, means in the beginning, so was that Varna system very uh, aggressively stated or it was mildly stated that anybody can choose any and was it dependent on the economy of the people? So the <coughs> Varna system in the beginning was rather vague as is well known because there were clearly people who were moving around in different ways in the 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 the, the, the Rig Veda itself clearly states that uh, my uh, I forget the exact sh shlok but you know I am a gambler but my my mother is a uh, does a, is a uh, I forget the exact shlok now I've blanked out but you know there is a shlok which basically mentions my 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 uh, mother is a grinder of corn and my father does something else and it's very obvious that there are there's a great deal of fluidity even in the even as late as the Mahabharat. You can clearly state, for example, uh, how fluid it was from the fact that in fact the Pandavas and the Kauravas did not actually have a drop of Kshatriya blood in them. Because their father, their grandfather was actually a Brahmin. Right? Ved Vyas. And so, if you went genetically, they were making a big deal about something that, genetically speaking, they weren't even themselves Kshatriyas. So, there was obviously a great deal of, in fact, there's a huge amount of fluidity. You know, you've got Matsya Gandha becomes the queen and all kinds of things are going on. So, people are moving around. There's even a story of the creation of a Brahmin. Right, for example, there is the story of Satyakam. What is the story of Satyakam? There is a Rishi teaching. There is a boy in the corner. He is listening. So he calls that boy in and says, why are you sitting there listening? So he says, I want to study from you. He says, okay, you can join my class. So you tell me as any school you go today, you have to do entry. Baap ka naam, ma ka naam, janam din sab parna hai. Usko pucha ki, okay, bharo, form bharo. So he asked, what is your father's name? So the little boy says, I do not know. So obviously the Rishi is a little thrown off. So he says, doesn't matter, you go and ask your mother, surely she'll know. So she goes off. 
turns out she is a dasi which is a courtesan or a prostitute we don't know but basically his mother did had slept with many many men and did not know the name of his father so he came back and truthfully told the rishi that i don't my mother also does not know the name of my father so obviously the whole class began laughing so the rishi looked at him sought clear talent clear interest in learning and he said look you have told me the truth even if it's an embarrassing truth so therefore you must be the son of a brahmin now this is not a genetic fact he is making it is simply stating that look you are worthy of being a brahmin so what happens satya kaam is incorporated into the class and he goes on to becoming a great rishi himself and a brahmin so the son of a prostitute who nobody know who his father is is incorporated into brahminhood so it is very clear this by the way, same thing is happening in different ways vishwamitra starts out being a kshatriya he becomes a brahmin the agarwal community comes from kshatriya and becomes from the baniya class right now today so there is upward and downward movement now this by the way fits with the legends every caste in india has you you will find everybody will have a tradition ki we came from here and there are repeated incorporations also so it's not just ki beginning mein hua uske baad there was no incorporation of castes you know the kshatriyas are fighting with various people you know dynasties are dying out and so on so you continuously need to bring new blood into the system right so you have many instances of history where new uh, groups are incorporated and given certain status so one obvious one which we know very well again well documented is that the gujjars created this great empire in the 8th 9th century 10th century now the gujjars were shudras they created a great empire they had a military elite which probably began to incorporate um, intermarry with the then kshatriya etc so what do, how do they how do they how, how are they given kshatriya status well there is a huge yagya that is held in mount abu and a whole bunch of agni kul kshatriyas are created these are the rajputs the rajputs are effectively the ruling elite of the gujjars intermarried with pre existing kshatriya chandravamsi suryavamsi clans so we have clear evidence of this uh, kind of uh, incorporation of castes um, uh, throughout our history so this is a much more fluid thing so it's not that caste did not exist it was much more messy uh, kind of thing that's why i always say the, the you know clean varna system never existed it's also shows through in the genetics um you know uh, uh, the brahmins have a particular group called r1a1 but so do the pasis who are actually called scheduled castes they are also r1a1 there are a whole bunch of tribes in southern india who are also r1a1 so <clears throat> um so you know so what i'm trying to say is that this is a much messier history repeated the reason it lasted so long was precisely that it was flexible the what happens in the british period is this is all put down and codified now once you codify something this fluidity is a more difficult thing to do and so here on a, diff a different kind of system begins to different kind of problem begins to arise and of course there are now there are reservations and other things that are linked now to this um but to start with it's reasonably fluid namaste sir yes sir what is a aryan invasion theory sir so the aryan invasion theory is very interesting because you see when the british in the very late 18th century discovered sanskrit the links to latin and so on they originally came up with the view that india must be the source of civilization because it looked like an ancient civilization there were these ancient books um rigveda etc they were clearly ancient 
And remember at that time they thought the world began in 4004 uh, AD, uh, BC. So <clears throat> the original view was that India must be the source of civilization. But then a few decades later they had conquered India. Now this was rather inconvenient because um, now you had to still acknowledge that these dark looking people you have conquered were uh, kind of the origins of your own superior civilization. By this point, by the way, various racial theories began to also emerge. So the Europeans, not just in India, but worldwide, the Europeans began to make the case that they were a superior race. So what they did is they said, yes, there was a superior race. And now, in order to justify their rule in India, they said, you know, you Indians, you're proud of your civilization. Guess what? Even this civilization was given to you by some white people who came called Aryans and who came and gave this civilization to you. So all that we are doing is by conquering you, we are just giving you a systems update. <laughs> so this was the way they were justifying themselves. Now, towards the very end of their rule, this is in the 20s and 30s, they discover some bunch of new buildings, etc., the Harappan buildings, which they didn't know about at the time of the, when they came up with the Aryan invasion theory. So they now had to incorporate this, now they are leaving, so there's new theory that has come, then these new buildings, what, no, they have this old theory and these new buildings, and they don't sit, seem to fit, particularly it didn't seem to fit the fact that they had decided entirely arbitrarily based on no archaeological or any evidence that the invasion happened in 1500 BC. The, the, the person who provided this general date um, was this German um, guy called Max Miller. He himself accepts that it's a completely arbitrary date. And yet it is there in you know, all the texts and this, that and the other. So now, if 1500 is when this is happening, and by this time, by the way, dating systems have appeared, and you have a mature city appearing, which is from 2000 BC, 3000 BC, you have these huge cities, then how do you put this Aryan theory with that? So then you just add two and two and make 22. See, these Aryans must have come and destroyed these big cities. Even though there is no evidence of these Aryans coming and destroying any cities, it's quite obvious that these cities were slowly fell into disuse and were abandoned. There is very clear evidence now of geological change. More importantly, the Rig, the Rig Veda, the Vedic texts, which are supposed to be the great Aryan texts, show absolutely no knowledge of Central Asia. Even worse, the idea was that these Aryans came with these chariots and these iron weapons, which were superior to whatever these uh, Harappans were using and must have defeated them. Well, there is a problem here. First of all, we know for sure now that iron is an Indian technology and it's not even from the north, it's from the Godavari Valley. It's a South Indian technology. So if anybody had a technological uh, sort of uh, superiority, it would have been the Indians, not these Aryans coming from the north. Even worse, let's say those chaps did come on chariots. I can assure you, without proper roads, going over the Hindu Kush, <laughs> they would have abandoned their chariots. And then going over six rivers, first the Sindhu and then five more rivers in Punjab. But this time definitely they would have abandoned it. So there is in fact no evidence of any chariots in West Punjab, Hari uh, 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 um, uh, Afghanistan. You have to go all the way to Kazakhstan and so on to find equivalents of chariots. So where are the earliest chariots in India? Well, in fact, they are the oldest, some of the oldest chariots in the world. They are actually from the Haryana West UP area and we now have found them. Sanoli. Right? There is no... So it's quite interesting. The oldest chariots found in India are not from the West. They are actually from the Gangetic Plains, not even the Saraswati. And they are clearly a very warlike people. Like a bunch of people who the so-called Aryans from the North would have not had, not had an easy time with. So the point I'm making is, the term Arya in the texts clearly means civilized or noble. 
it does not have any racial context in fact all the handsome aryas of our texts are all spectacularly dark <laughs> krishna is dark his name means dark the beautiful woman of the of the mahabharat is panchali her other name is krishna ram is dark arjun is dark so even if there were these aryans they were definitely dark <laughs> <laughs> so the point point is this is this completely absurd racial theory that has been put on us and there is this whole industry which survives till till this day trying to justify that somehow the aryans came from somewhere else this is absurd because it, there is no racial context to it but as i said cultural appropriation is not some harmless thing once this idea of this superior race of aryans existed it was then happily used because you see the germans didn't couldn't take on the romans so easily because after all they had been fighting the romans they were the enemies so they created this mythical past using indian symbols they so took over the swastik they took over the word arya and they create this entire mythology based partly on indian and partly on nordic uh, mythology and create this ridiculous racial theory now of course everybody hates the nazis but everybody was in this business the british were also into this business which is what they did in india so this is why i keep saying cultural appropriation is a bad thing which is why i always object to hindi rappers rapping in bollywood <laughs> they really can't do it a big fan of yours uh, i have a question about uh, you talked about this uh, open architecture of our basic things that the bharat tribe people have come up with obviously there was some problem in the implementation of it so that the core of it or the abstract idea of it in in this case the operating system got corrupted no look these are ancient people they don't think that in year 2024 in april in iit kharagpur some guy will be discussing it but they did create a system that is stunning that it is still around and it still functions no i, I agree <laughs> with that so what i'm trying to it was not a perfect system not everybody signed up to it clearly the parsas didn't right so what my question is that uh, in today's day so from our past learnings how can we take this idea forward at least to protect that core idea so first of all i think first of all we need to understand that there is a core idea <clears throat> i had to actually piece to get now all this pro information is freely available and yet very very few people actually express it the way i have clearly expressed it and yet if you go and read the original texts is very clear that that is what they were thinking so what they did is they divided up all of knowledge texts etc into two groups and they were very clear which was the operating system and which were the apps they gave one the name the shruti and they called smriti smritis are all the other texts other than the vedic samhitas so it's if you have to be very strict about it the vedic samhitas the shruti texts are do, do not include even the atharva veda to some if you were very strict about it i think the atharva veda should include it personally it does not include the brahmanas which is the explanatory notes it does not even i know vedantists dislike me when i say this <coughs> but it does not also include the upanishads everything else is a smriti smriti is the accumulated thoughts or memories of great thinkers post the shruti texts so what does the shruti text do the shruti text is the rigveda which is the philosophical framework which includes several things one is all the idea of the of the contract it includes the nasadiya suktam what is interesting about the nasadiya suktam is it starts by saying in the beginning what there was i do not know perhaps the gods know perhaps they know not the perhaps the sages know perhaps they know not surely the great creator knows and perhaps he too knows not 
So this is very important because it is, it is setting in motion the possibility of continuously adding new knowledge, which is a very different conception than saying there is one God and this is the last prophet. It's a fundamentally different idea. So instead what you do is you create an operating system which is deliberately op open-ended. The sum weight, by the way, is just the rig weight put to some music. 90% of it is the same. So it's actually not new knowledge. And then there's the Yajur Ved, which is actually a set of, it is the chants and the instructions of how to do a common minimum program of rituals. Okay. So what you have, you have a philosophical framework, a contract and some common rituals. This is all there is. This is the operating principle. Now you can keep adding new things. And those who are adding new things are called, these are the, they are called the Smriti texts. They are not canonical. You don't have to even accept the Bhagavad Gita to be a Hindu. Okay. And notice how the Bhagavad Gita is presented to us as well. It is not the word of God. It is as reported by Sanjay. So those who are putting it down are very clear. Why are they doing it this way? Because they don't want some future generation in IIT Kanpur. They are sitting here. Somebody say, but this is a, it is the word of God. It must, Bhagavad Gita is so holy. It must be a Shruti text. It's not. It is also a Smriti text. And by the way, the Mahabharata itself has many other Gitas. So, what I'm trying to tell you is that there is this extraordinary system of accumulating new knowledge. And if some of you decide in this room to write another new text, it is entirely allowed to you. It will, not, it will be a Smriti text. If everybody accepts it, maybe it will become a new Upanishad. I don't know. That's for future generations to do. But I'm sorry, unless you are a Rishi, you cannot mess with the Shruti texts. You cannot write a new Veda unless you are a Rishi. But you can keep writing new Upanishads. You can write new Puranas. In fact, I am a big votary that these, these traditions should be revived and we should write new Puranas. Okay. okay, so... Thank you very much. I think I'm tiring now. I now request all the members of the History Society and IKS IIT Kanpur to come up on the stage for an official group photograph with Sanjeev Sanal, sir. <laughs>